I want to open with a scripture I shared last week out of the book of Matthew, chapter 13. Jesus is speaking. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree. So the birds of the air come and nest on its branches. Last week, I was sharing with you about the principles of the kingdom of God. It's very important for us to understand, just like the scripture says, the kingdom of God is like a person who takes a mustard seed, which is the smallest of the seeds. But when you plant it in the garden, most of us wouldn't be familiar with this, but when the mustard seed grows and turns into a plant, it literally looks like a tree. Now, he said that's the way the kingdom of God works. It starts very small, but then the end, it's going to be predominant. Now, as Christmas season comes our way, we'll be celebrating the nativity, the birth of Jesus Christ in the city of Bethlehem, and we'll be talking about the birth of the Christ child. Now, that's what this scripture is alluding to. The kingdom of God, as it would manifest among the nations, literally began with Jesus Christ. Nobody recognized him as a king. He wasn't in the right political class. He wasn't in the right economic class. He certainly didn't come the way the people thought he would, but he became a seed. In another place, the Bible calls him a stone that impacted all the nations. Now, if you think about over these last 2,000 years, when literally billions of people call themselves Christians, how many know we've already seen how that little seed has become so awesome and powerful? But we have to understand we haven't seen anything yet because the Bible tells us in the other parables that when it fully is manifested, that the yeast of the kingdom, the seed of the kingdom, is going to impact every part of the world. This next verse of Scripture talks about the mission of Mount Zion. I've often called it our vision, but I really believe this is a very important time in the plans and purposes of God. It's time for us to know that God is saying this is an appointed time to know what God has spoken and begin to walk in the word by faith with a great expectation. Look what this next verse of Scripture says. It says, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains. It shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Now, if I was to ask you, well, in the latter days of time, why is it that people are going to turn and say, we need to go to the house of God? This next part says why. It says, because he will teach us of his ways. Then we can walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and it goes on to say in the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Church, we need to understand something, that we're living in a time when the systems of men will be shaken to the core. We're living in a time when the world's going to begin to realize their wisdom, which is apart from God, isn't working for them. And they're going to begin to look for answers. And I believe they're going to find them in the house of God. Amen? That's why the people are going to look at the house of God in these latter days of time. Now, of course, we love the presence of God, but it doesn't say they're going to come because of the presence. We love the fact that God does signs and wonders and answers our prayers, but it doesn't say that's why they're going to come. They're going to come because they're going to say, you know what? When people live according to the word, it produces results. And we've not been living according to the word of God, so we need to make some changes. How can we get some help? And we're truly living in a time as never before when it's becoming more obvious, and I believe we're on the verge of some things that's going to prove it's more obvious, that we will begin to see the nations, the people, turning to the Lord in these latter days of time. Now, today's message I want to share with you, first of all, prophetic insight. I believe we're living in a time when we need to know what the Spirit is speaking so we can relate to it. Then I want to talk about the fact that there are some practical things that we need to do to demonstrate the gospel, if you would, to our community and our world in order that we would understand it, but also begin to realize that we're living in a time when we have to realize the philosophies of the world are very opposed to the principles of the kingdom. And so if we do not follow God's way, we're not going to be any different than the world, and we certainly aren't going to give them an example that they can follow. So this is a very important uh, message that I'm sharing with you today. Again, I believe very prophetic, but very powerful in the day and hour in which we live. Now look what this next verse of scripture says. It says, therefore behold, I will again do a marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. 
Now, in August the 14th, on a Sunday morning, I shared with you a burden that I felt in the Wednesday night service. Like Dan was saying, there is a stream that's flowing in the Holy Spirit right now that's a fresh stream. Be sure and get into the waters of His refreshing at this time. And at the close of the service at the altar call when the Spirit of God was moving, I felt a tremendous burden, and all I heard is the word confusion out of the midst of that. And I mentioned to you on August the 14th that word and, and gave this explanation. In the Old Testament, it talks about the story of the Tower of Babel. The Bible tells us that at that time in early history, mankind got together and said, let's make a name for ourselves. Let's kind of do our own thing so we can build a tower that builds up to heaven. Now, the Bible says that they said, now, let's take our bricks that we have. And there was a time in history when bricks were invented. It seemed like such an awesome technology at the time, because before that, they used stones and things of the earth, but now they have their bricks. Now, that's a beautiful picture of man thinking that, well, if I build something with my own hands, I can make a name for myself, and I really don't need God. Versus where the Bible always speaks about our foundation and what we're doing as stones because how many stones is something God makes, not what man makes. But anyway, when man set uh, himself in this direction, the end result is God sent confusion to them. Now, the Bible is a book that reveals the eternal purposes of God. And so you have to understand the continuity of the message. That's why in the last book of the Bible, the book of the Revelation, it talks about Babylon. Babylon was a literal place, but spiritually it speaks of that which comes from the confusion of that which is opposite of what God is doing. Because the end result of man's way is always going to bring confusion, where the end result of God's way is it will bring life and blessing to us. I shared that day a prophetic word because I said we need to get ready because confusion's coming, and we the people of God need to understand that we're not appointed for confusion we're appointed for standing on the rock, Christ Jesus, with confidence. Amen? And as I look at what's happening even this week in the political realm, I'm saying there's confusion going on in our world in which we live. I, I see it when I look in the economic realm, and I'll talk a little bit about that today. We have to understand that the end result of Babylon is confusion. That's why God said, I'm building a kingdom that can stand. I will shake everything that can be shaken, but my word will stand. And that's why this talks about the wisdom of God, because God's going to do a great work in these days. And the wonderful thing about it is we're called to be a part of it. Isn't that awesome, church? God has called us to be a part of his plan. To be a part of that plan, we have to understand we got to walk in his way. We have to keep his path, because it's in that that our life can demonstrate something for the world to see and we can be that living demonstration of the glory and the power of God. Now, this next verse of Scripture is very significant in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, For the Jews request a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God the wisdom of God, because the foolish of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, the reason this scripture is very significant because the Jews represented the religious establishment. In the Old Testament, they had seen many signs and wonders, and so they were very signs and wonders oriented. Of course, as a local church, we believe in signs and wonders. We see God work miraculous things all the time. But sometimes in our Christianity even, just like the Jews, we can become signs-oriented and we can think that by using God's name or using the principles of the Word of God, we can kind of set our own course of life. And that's basically what the Jews were looking for. That's why they rejected Christ. Now, the Greeks looked after wisdom and that would represent the secular world who were looking for their own wisdom apart from God. Now, in this day and hour in which we live, we have to understand something. God's looking for the church to experience a revival that produces an awakening in our nation. That's why I wrote the book on the Great Awakening, because in our history as a nation, there's been times of awakenings that literally turned our nation around. They start with what we call a revival. That's when the people of God get excited and alive. But it 
translates into impacting the nation by the nation seeing there's something that's happening in the church or something that's being transmitted from the church to the society that begins to bring a change in the world in which we live. So as a local church, we're not a revival-oriented church. We believe in revival, and I know we have them all every time we come to church. But we're looking for that awakening. What is it that God can do in our midst that's going to change our world? You see, Christ and the power of the cross is opposite of what the world says because how many know giving your life on the cross doesn't make a whole lot of sense? That's why the Bible says, had the rulers of this world known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But oftentimes, even the religious people rejected it for this very same reason. It's like, well, I don't want it to go that way. So God says, the power of God, the wisdom of God. The power of the Christ, the wisdom of the Christ. What was the wisdom of the Christ? Well, he said in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, this isn't the way I want to go, but I'm going to go the way you want me to do. Not my will, but thine be done. And though, although he went through some difficulty, the end result was the release of supernatural power. And that's what God's saying to the church today. That's the same process by which we need to walk in this day that we can receive the fullness of everything that God has for us. Look at this next verse of Scripture. It says, For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might, who would not fear thee, O King of nations? For to thee doth it pertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. This is about the brutish people. Now, if you notice, there's some words here seem a little old-fashioned. That's because I'm using the King James Version versus the New King James. The reason for that is this chapter has a pro poetic flow to it that you can see using the King James Version. That's why I chose to do that because it's very important for us, if we read this chapter, to see the flow. And number one, I want to talk about, well, what does it mean to be brutish? Now, the word brutish literally means to consume something either by eating or by fire. So when it says, you have become brutish, now the New King James says dull-hearted. It, it has the same implications, but it isn't quite so clear. A dull-hearted person is a person who's set their heart on their own way rather than God's way, and this is the end result. Versus a, a greater amplification here, which is an idea that, well, I, I want to consume. I want it to be about my satisfaction. What is it that's going to satisfy my hunger? What is it that's going to satisfy my thirst? In our natural human condition, we are very highly motivated to look for our own satisfaction. And we have in our mind what it's going to take for us to get that. But we have to understand that God's way is that, no, we deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him, which means I'm going to go God's way, even though it seems like it might be against me. Now, if you were to read about the economies of the world, you'll know that they'll say concerning the United States of America, we are a consumer-oriented society because 70% of our economy is not based on what we produce, but what we consume. And that's why when the world is thinking about what's best for them in the international realm, they're going to be thinking, well, the Americans are our best customers. What can we do to sell them stuff? And if we're not careful or mindful of this and we're just thinking about consuming and not producing, it could have a negative end result because in the end, if you're just consuming, just consuming isn't long before you're consumed yourself. We live in a marketing-oriented society and we receive stimulus just about everywhere we turn to get something that we want. I, I was on a Macy's website on a Saturday looking for something that I'd seen in the store to see if they had it on the website because they didn't have it in the store. And every time I get on the internet since then, there's Macy's ad showing that kind of a design. Why? Because the internet is set up where they know what you're looking at. And as soon as they know what you're looking at, somebody's selling you an advertising. So it's there all the time. How many know technology? They're watching you. And they know just exactly what will make you happy if you buy it. Anyway, we have to understand there is a mindset that's consumer-oriented that we need to be very, very careful of in this brutish society. Now, when it talks about the word stock there, it's talking about an idol. It says it more clearly there in the New King James, but 
It's talking about in the old days, they would go out in the field, and it describes it there in Jeremiah chapter 10. They might say, cut down a tree, form it into a statue, and then put it on an altar and start to worship it. Now, that seems totally crazy to us. And if we look back and see how people were worshiping animals or statues they had made, you think, that's dumb. They're just worshiping something that they've made. Well, the Bible talks about that because they're worshiping the works of their own hands, and we do that even today, but in a more sophisticated way. When the wisdom of the world says there's no creator, that we basically were created from the creation itself, evolution says there was no need for God. Basically, we all started from some gases many years ago. How many know, I didn't come from gas, how about you? We came from the hand of the Lord. We'll, we'll let the world say they came from some gases working together. But we have to understand that's the wisdom of the world, and in the end, it becomes their form of worship because they say, I've been created by the creation, and so I, in a sense, am worshiping the creation. Every time man puts together a system, we have an economic system that has come up and arisen in recent years of history. It's the formulation of man's ideas. This is how we can stop ourselves from suffering. This is how we can avoid uh, downturns. And, and so that in itself can be a God because we say, look what we've made. We won't suffer. And God says, the day will come when if you follow a principle that is not according to my word, where you'll find out, hey, God's way is the best way. Amen. And so we need to be very mindful of that because we have to realize the world in which we're living, what mindsets are there, if we want to be able to work against what's going on and live in the power and the reality of the kingdom of God. This next verse of scripture tells us something very important. It says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must what? Support the weak. I remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is what? More blessed to give than receive. Well, this is just the opposite of what we would think. We would think the blessing comes by getting what we want. God says the blessing comes by seeing whatever somebody else needs and ministering to them. This isn't just a law. It's a principle. That means there's a satisfaction that comes from it, and there's also a blessing. One of the things that's going on in our world today, it's recorded, and you see it all the time in the news, and they're talking about even in the presidential primaries that one of the biggest topics, even in a, in a state like New Hampshire that is uh, above middle class typically, the biggest problem they all wanted to know what the politicians could do is we have this terrible problem with heroin that's destroying families and kids, and it, it, it's such an awful thing, and they want the politicians to come up with a solution Church, I want you to understand something. They might come up with part of solutions sometimes. But how many know the real source of life is God? Amen? And, and so God says to the church, and I've been sure in that, and, and recently I've done some funerals that it just has put a fire within me. we got to make a difference in the world in which we live. We have to know there's a solution in the house of God that maybe isn't out there in the world. Come on, give the Lord a praise. But if we follow His way... We can find the life he has for us. And so what does he do? He says to the church, you need to, in the church, support the weak. Now, some people will say, well, if somebody's weak, that's their problem. Don't they know about the power of God? Well, the apostle Paul himself one day was facing something. He sought the Lord three times. He said, you got to take this from me. And the Lord said, no. He said, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. He says, you're going to find out that my grace is sufficient for you. I mean, sometimes we have weaknesses that we have to draw on the strength of God, but also we have to draw on the strength of one another. Anybody out there know that to be true? Now, some people have it that can be very severe, and that's when it ends up like an uh, overdose of some drug or whatever happens to them in life. And so God says to the church, well, one of the things we have to do is we have to do that which the word declares, and we have to realize that if somebody is weak in the house of God, we got to say to them, we will be strength for you to get you to the place that you need to go. Amen? In the world, they call it a recovery program because the idea in a recovery program is that, well, 
People oftentimes in there cannot help themselves, so they need a support group that will get around them, rally around them, help them get through the situation, hold them up, and when they make mistakes, be able to help them and receive them and give them life. How many know that certainly is a Christian doctrine, amen, that we would support the weak and be that kind of a place, and we the people of God need to all see that we, as we understand the principle of the Word of God, we need to say, well, who is there in the house of God who needs support? I want to strengthen those who are weak. I want to do what God says, and I want to say to them, I, I, I want to be there to help you. I want to be strength for you so that you can receive that which God has for you. And so as a part of our process, of course, we'll be trying to get people to understand that and have a development of a more uh, intensive recovery and help program in that area. But next to that, there's another important scripture I want to read to you because it tells us another aspect of what we have to deal with. And I call this that the heroin addiction, as many of other problems of our country, must also be addressed as symptoms of a deeper problem. Jeremiah said it this way, why the people were brutish is because they did not want to deal with issues, they just wanted to feel good. And he says, woe is me for my hurt. My wound is severe, but I say truly this is a firmity or weakness. I must bear it. My tent is plundered, all my cords are broken, my children have gone from me, there are no more. There is no one to pitch my tent anymore or set up my curtains. And of course, here the prophet is talking about the conditions of the time in which he was living, and they were terrible times because it was affecting his whole family. And he said, Well, in this situation, I've got to decide, even though this has come my way, I've got to take this problem. And I got to bear my hurt, and I have to be willing to fight against that so I can take the next step that life has to offer. How many of you know when you're going through a trial, you're going through a difficulty, it becomes very easy to become trial oriented or problem oriented and allow yourself to be overwhelmed? Now, the reason I'm saying this is a society problem because we're living in a society that says life should be pain free. And because we are a marketing society and it's about making people happy, even when people go to doctors sometimes, they will give them prescriptions that they don't need or beyond what they would need. And because of that, people are saying, well, what can I do? I don't want to face pain. And there's a general idea in our society, even the recently enacted Affordable Care Act that has tried to expand the level of insurance our nation had, they send a thing to hospitals and doctors saying, our, one of our priorities is we have to help people with their pain. Now, we have to understand something that that's a good thing. I appreciate doctors and I appreciate medicine. But when we get medicine for pain, whether it's psychological or whether it's physical, we should see that as a help for us to be able to get us to the next level so we can start dealing with our pain. But too often times, in the manner of thinking of the world is, well, this hasn't taken away my pain, so give me some more. Or where can I get another source? Because sooner or later to get to that next level, how many of you know there has to be a place of dealing with the pain of our situation and making a choice to follow on to know the Lord? This is what our life enrichment classes are about. And I talked about last week how we have a new class on anxiety disorders. And if you go by the district table today, you'll see a, a wider range of classes we have because our life enrichment program is not a recovery program. As a matter of fact, when we first started, we called it Overcomers, and many people were thinking of it in terms of that, but this is really what we'd call that second stage, where people are ready and able to deal with situations, and it's not certainly just about drugs, it's about emotional issues like anxiety, there's programs or classes for people who've been through difficult times in the past that need healing, whatever it is that we have need of. We need to realize that sometimes we got to take advantage of a program. we got to push ourselves maybe to the pain level because it's in the pain level that sometimes we're going to find our deliverance. And so this is the second aspect of our programming. And it's a very important principle to understand because in a consumer-oriented society, there really isn't no place for pain, but that is not what the Bible teaches. 
The Bible teaches us that we should follow the wisdom and the power of God. Look what this next verse of Scripture says. It says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, then he no longer should live the rest of his life in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Now, when people think about Jesus Christ, now you want to talk about somebody who's spiritual, how many know Jesus would have obviously been the most spiritual person? He worked miracles, signs, and wonders, and that drew crowds to him. But how did he defeat the devil, and how did he make an appropriation for our sins? How many know he went to the cross and died? Now, that didn't look spiritual, but it was the most spiritual event of all history and time. It was something natural and something practical that required pain and something he didn't want to go through. But when he was willing to do that, he not only was able to overcome that through resurrection power, but he was able to do that for others as well. And that's what we understand as Christians, that sometimes we have to go through some difficult times. We can't look that the Holy Spirit is going to be a sedative to take away our pain. Sometimes we have to bear that pain. Just like Jeremiah, we have to say, woe is me for my hurt, but I'm going to take this because although I don't like the situation, I'm going to have the best marriage I could have. I'm going to have the best relationships with the body of Christ I can have. I'm not going to walk around with this problem forever. I'm going to rise above it. How many know the Bible says, he that overcometh shall inherit all things? How many want to be an overcomer in the Lord these days? And so this is a part of the prescription plan that the Bible says we got to lay out there as we take the progress of, you would, in these steps to the best life that God has for us. The Bible says that Jesus said, I didn't just come to make you alive. I have come to give you what? The abundant life. Anybody out there want the abundant life? God tells us how to do that. Amen? It says, for the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Behold, the noise of the bruit is come. That's why I talk about the poetic aspect of this, because it talks about brutish behavior, and then it embodies it in the bruit, which sounds like a monster that has come from the way of thinking, and that's really what's happening in the world in which we live today. That's why we have to realize, if we're going to deal with this drug addiction problem, we've got to help people deal with it. Then when we can take people to the next level, we're going to do that. And, and this is how we can get there. But we also have to understand the mindset of the age in which we live. And it's so easy for us to buy into the thinking of the world without even realizing it. That's why he talks about the pastors. Now, keep in mind, in Jeremiah's day, this wasn't just shepherds as it obtained the pastor of the church, but pastors as leaders and, and even the kings as leaders, whatever. Now, he says, the pastors haven't sought the Lord. How, how many know as a pastor, my job is to seek the Lord and give you the word of the Lord? And, and I can't say, well, you know, what's a good strategy to make this church grow? And I'm going to do this. And I'm, What is it that people really want? And, and some churches have followed that procedure. And we have to be very, very careful because the Bible says when the bruit comes, and I can hear his noise just like Jeremiah can, that the people will be scattered if they haven't been taught the right way. Amen? If I just do what I can do to make you happy when you come to church, when your time of trouble comes, you won't make it. And when the time of com trouble comes, you won't be prepared to help other people. Our job as the church is when you come to teach you how to become part of a family. And when you're in a family, you got to help each other. you got to celebrate with each other, but you also have to bear one another's burdens. And you have to realize this, family life can be so awesome, but it can also be a pain. But it's God's plan of action for life. Church, I hear the no noise of the Bruit. In the international way, uh, some people aren't interested in international uh, things, especially if we're talking about economics, but if you were to see what's going on in the world and watch what's happening, we have what's called the International Monetary Fund. There, there's a woman by the name of Christine Lagarde who's the president of that. And 
Watching the news, people say, is the Federal Reserve going to raise rates or they're not going to raise rates? Well, I've observed that if you want to know what's really going to happen, don't look what's happening in the national level. Look what's happening in the international level because there's influences in the international that are telling our nation what to do. And she has said all along, no, it's not time, it's not time. Guess what? She's the one that's been making the choices. And she just this week had a a meeting where she says, you know, the world is $152 trillion in debt. That's almost two and a half times the output of the goods and services of the nations of the world. There's a severe problem here, and it's worse than it's been since before the catastrophe that supposedly woke everybody else up in 2008. But she said, fortunately, most of that debt's personal and corporate. The governments aren't as much in debt as they could be. So this opens the door because the next phase they're going to start telling governments, and you'll hear this in our country, next year, whoever the president is, they're going to be saying, well, we need to spend money if we really want this economy to go somewhere. And they're going to follow a different tone, but it's all going to be about the same thing. They'll probably say it's for infrastructure. We've got to build roads, airports, or whatever. But it's all going to be about spending, spending, spending. God has this simple thing that says in his word, well, if you want something, you have to work to get it. Sometimes you even have to save money. Oh, and sometimes you need to save money for a little while. But don't ever think that you create an economic system where nobody's going to have to suffer pain or there's going to be a a cure-all for every nation of the world. That There's a certain course of action. You could even look at it as natural, But I'm just telling you that so you can understand. There are international forces that, to me, represent the Bruid, if you would, because they're saying, what can we do? What human wisdom and thought? What system of man can we create where we can eliminate all the pain and all the suffering? And God says, just follow my word. Go my way. The question is, Will you be a person that goes his way? Now, sometimes that's not easy. That's why the last scripture I want to share with you is literally the prophet himself saying, oh, Lord, I know the way of man isn't in himself, so I'm not going to come up with my own plan of action. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Oh, Lord, correct me, but with justice. Don't get mad at me, not in your anger, lest you bring me nothing. Pour out that fury on the Gentiles, and of course, He's praying this prayer because of the Gentile nations have invaded his country who do not know you and the families who do not call upon your name. Let that consumption come upon them. But Lord, I am willing to say in my life, let me be corrected. I want to follow your word. I'm going to do what you have to say. And I know when I do, Lord, I'm going to receive the blessing. Give the Lord a praise on that. We need to rejoice in the word of God. And understand how awesome and powerful our God is when we choose to walk in his way. Can we all please bow our heads and close our eyes for just a moment?